Shalom, praise the Lord. Welcome to class, everyone. Thank you for uh, joining the class on Romans. Um, Monday, we began looking at uh, Romans chapter 3. Uh, we'll continue our study on Romans chapter 3. Uh, for that, we'll just pause for a word of prayer. So can one of you please uh, lead us in prayer, please? Anyone lead us in prayer? Let's pray. Dear God in heaven, we thank you, we praise you, we bless you, Lord, for this session that we are going to have. Lord, we ask, Holy Spirit, to please guide us, lead us, and anoint our dear pastor as she will be teaching us. Father God, we thank you for all the students that have gathered in this class. Lord, we just want to do your will. Father God, let your will be done in and through our lives. Thank you, Lord. We bless, bless you. Give you all glory, honor, and praise. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Rosalind. Uh, we also like to welcome all our e-learning students. I hope you're enjoying uh, the study on the book of uh, Romans. Uh, so we began looking at chapter 3. In chapter 3, Paul, you know, um, uh, presents two sets of rhetorical questions. Uh, the first set of rhetorical questions uh, is regarding God's judgment. And the second set of rhetorical questions is about the Jews and the uh, law. Now, between these two sets of rhetorical questions, you know, Paul sandwiches uh, the main conclusion and the key truth that he likes to present. So after he presents the first set of rhetorical questions on God's judgment, he presents the main conclusion that all have sinned. And then he presents the key truth uh, that, you know, we are justified or we are made righteous through um, faith. Okay. So the four main questions um, under uh, the topic God's judgment. The first question is, what if some did not believe, which he asks in uh, verses 3, and he answers that uh, in verse 4 as well. And the second uh, question, second main question, is uh, what he presents in verses 5 to 7, which he asks the question and answers. The second question is, is God unjust who inflicts wrath when he still, and will he still get the glory out of our sin? So is God unjust? who inflicts wrath when he still gets the glory out of our uh, sin. The third question is in um, verse 8, where he says, let us do evil that good may come. Okay, And he answers that as well. And uh, the fourth main question he presents uh, in um, verses 9, where he says, are Jews better than uh, Gentiles? Okay, and then he answers all of these four questions, uh, and then he presents the main conclusion that all of uh, all of us, whether you're Jews or Gentiles, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, which he uh, presents in uh, the same chapter, Romans chapter three, verses ten to uh, twenty, and then he uh, Paul presents the key truth that it's not uh, the law. And it's not the, the sign of the covenant with the circumcision that, you know, is going to make us justified or righteous uh, before God. But then Paul, you know, presents this key truth that we are justified and we are made righteous through faith in Christ Jesus. And now he begins, you know, presenting, uh, you know, or he, he, he now begins a grand presentation of the gospel in verses 21 to uh, 26. So we looked uh, at verses 21 to 26 um, on Monday, uh, where he talks about, uh, you know, that we are made righteous uh, to our faith in Christ Jesus, or we are justified by faith. Now the words just, justify, justification, justifier, justly, righteous, righteousness, righteously, all come from the same uh, uh, Greek root word, which basically or simply means what is right. So 
when you look at righteousness, righteousness is being right or it's the act of doing what is right and just. Or righteousness uh, can also mean, you know, being approved and acceptable before God. And righteousness is also doing what is approved, um, you know, uh, is uh, is uh, used elsewhere in scripture, which is not just a state of being approved and acceptable to God, but is also doing what is approved and acceptable to um, God. Okay, so that is what he's uh, talking about in verses uh, 21 to 26. Um, and he also, we also looked at not just uh, righteousness, but, you know, uh, we, we saw in verse 25 that, you know, uh, where Paul talks about, uh, about Jesus, where he says, who God set forth as a propitiation uh, by his blood, okay? So, you know, the word propitiation in the Greek is translated mercy seat. And we looked at, uh, you know, the whole example of uh, the mercy seat in the tabernacle and, uh, you know, how Jesus Christ uh, became the atoning sacrifice for our sin. And it is his blood that makes us righteous. Uh, it is the blood that the, you know, the, the high priest, when he enters into the Holy of Holies, he sprinkles the blood of the mercy seat and that makes man righteous before God. And that is how man is able to meet and speak with God. Similarly, Jesus is our mercy seat, which means he has made the atoning sacrifice for our sins. And it is his blood, you know, that... Um, makes us righteous before God. We have a right standing before God. It's not our works, but it's Christ's righteousness imputed uh, upon us or his righteousness covering us uh, that gives us uh, uh, the opportunity to be right with God and also to be able to meet and speak with uh, God. So in verse 5, you know, this whole thing demonstrates God's righteousness. Uh, in, in the past, God, uh, you know, um, uh, overlooked uh, uh, sin, which means uh, not that he uh, did not, uh, you know, condone sin, but it's just that he did he did not pour out all of his judgment on sin right there um, in the past. But he reserved it to be poured out, you know, on the cross um, when Jesus died on the cross. The sins of the entire mankind was poured out on Jesus Christ. And when Jesus died, he made that full, sufficient, perfect sacrifice that appeased God, that satisfied uh, uh, God, uh, what God was looking for, uh, you know, uh, as a payment, as a ransom for our sin. And um, hence, you know, in doing so, you know, we have been made righteous with God. And we also saw that God is both righteous or just in uh you know, in condoning sin, in judging sin, and he's also in declaring us as uh, righteous uh, before God because of the sacrifice that Jesus made. So God is both righteous or just and the justifier, which means God is just in judging sin and acquitting the sinner. And God is able to do it because of uh, what Jesus has done on the cross, that he satisfied the payment for um, sin. Okay, so that's basically a, a short recap of what we looked at on Monday. Um, now we would um, go ahead and, um, you know, uh, look at verses um, um, 27 to 31. So can somebody uh, read verses uh, 27 to 31 of Romans chapter 3, which is basically the set, next second set of rhetorical questions where uh, Paul is talking about the Jews and the law. So the first set of rhetoricals is about God's judgment. Then the second set of rhetorical questions, which he presents in 27 to 31, is about the Jews and the law. So can one of you please read um, Romans chapter 3, verses 27 to 31, please? Verse 27. Where is the boasting then? It is excluded by what law of works? No, but by the law of faith. Therefore, we conclude 
that a man is justified by faith apart from the deeds of the law? Or is he the God of the Jews only? Is he not also the God of the Gentiles? Yes, of the Gentiles also, since there is one God who will just who will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through faith. Do we then make void the law through faith? Certainly not. On the contrary, we establish the law. Amen. Thank you, Roslyn. So here, Paul, in these verses, he asks three questions. Uh, you know, he says, what about the law? What about the works? Where is the boasting uh, then? Okay, so uh, he says the first question is, you know, where is the boasting? He says, you know, no one can boast. No one can take credit for themselves. He says, we cannot boast of the law and the works. And he says that no one can boast because now, you know, everything is by faith. It's not by keeping the law. It's not by following certain uh, rituals. or uh, It's not by keeping certain days or uh, certain feasts. It's also not by keeping, uh, uh, you know, the sign of the covenant with the circumcision. But everything now is by faith. So he says, how is boasting excluded? Uh, it's excluded because, you know, the law of faith has come in. So he's, Paul is slowly guiding uh, the Jews or the people uh, in the church at Rome to the next topic, which is faith, um, which he discusses or he presents in chapter 4. So in verse 28, he's presenting the conclusion and he's saying that man is made righteous or man is justified by faith. So man is put in a right standing with God. A God a man is made faultless and blameless before God by faith. And he says it's not dependent on the deeds of the law. It's not by keeping the law. It's not by doing things of the law. It's not by following certain food rituals or uh, uh, circumcision, um, uh, you know, uh, rituals. But he says, you know, a person is justified or made righteous by his faith. So the first question he asks, uh, rhetorical question, is where is the... Uh, boasting and he says no we can't boast no you know because now it's the law of faith and it's not just the law or it's not the, the written law um, uh, or the uh, you know the works that we do but it is the law of faith the second question he uh, asked the rest, second rhetorical question under this main heading of uh, the Jews and the law is in verse 29 he, he asks is he the God of Jews only? Is he not also the God of the Gentiles? And then he answers this question by saying, yes, he is not only the God of the Jews, but he's also the God of the uh, Gentiles. So Paul says, though God gave the law and the covenant to the Jew first, yet he is God both of the Jews and the Gentiles. Okay, and he says in verse 30 that both Jews and Gentiles are going to be justified by faith. So whether you are circumcised, he's telling the Jews, Jews, whether you're circumcised, or he's telling the Gentiles whether you are uncircumcised, you know, it's going to be by faith that we are all going to be justified. So he's basically, you know, coming to the main point, the main uh you know, he's getting to the main thing that he's trying to get them to or help them to understand. He's getting them to the main point. And then he says, you know, uh, if you're not, we are going to be justified, not, um, or we're going to be made righteous, not by keeping the law or the works of the law or the sign of the circumcision. Then he says, what is the use of the law then? Okay. Uh, and then Paul says, you know, we're not making void of the law. We're not saying that the law is useless. But, you know, on the contrary, Paul says, we establish the law. So how do we establish the law? Uh, because we have stated already that 
no one can keep the law. Paul has already mentioned that, you know, in our own physical strength, we cannot keep the law. All of us are sinners and the law serves that purpose. Uh, how does the law serve the purpose? The law has exposed that we are all sinners. The law has uh, shown us that we all stand guilty before uh, God. And uh, the same sin that law has condemned, God has also condemned that in the person of Jesus Christ on the cross. And God has judged it in the person of Christ. So, uh, you know, uh, God has just, uh, God has uh, judged it in the person of Christ or God has just judged that in the work of Christ on the cross so that through that God can justify people who have faith in Christ Jesus. So he's saying faith in effect has actually established the law because everyone has come to this place uh, you know, where you can have faith in Christ Jesus. So faith is not telling us that the law is not necessary, but faith comes in because the law was there, but we were unable to keep the law. We were not able to keep the law. We couldn't match up to the law and our works fell short uh, of the requirements of the law. So faith had to come in and faith in uh, it's not doing away with the law, but faith is actually fulfilling the law. Faith is saying, you know, this is the whole purpose. The law showed us that we couldn't do it in our own strength. The, uh, the law showed us that we couldn't keep the law. Uh, the law showed us that we are sinners. The law showed us that we are guilty. The law showed us that we are we cannot be righteous in um God's eye in our own strength by keeping the law. So the only way we can be made righteous is going through faith. Okay, so the only way that we can be made righteous is keeping the law of faith or is going through faith. So Paul is saying faith in effect has established the law. So everyone has now come to this place where we have faith in God and uh, saying that, hey, we can't keep the law and hence we've come to faith in Christ Jesus. So we are basically establishing the law. We are affirming, that, uh, uh, affirming the law that yes, we cannot keep it. And hence we need God's grace. We need God's strength and we need his help. And hence we come to him in uh, faith. So faith is established for the law has always been telling us that we have fallen short of the glory of God. And so this is what he concludes. So even in the Old Testament, you know, all of the sacraments that uh, or all of the rituals that God has given the Israelites, the law, everything, uh, you know, every sacrifice, every law, every commandment, you know, was actually pointing out to uh, the Lord Jesus Christ was pointing out to the Savior, was pointing out to the Messiah. So if you look at, study this, the, the, the sacrifices, we see that all of those sacrifices were fulfilled uh, when, you know, when Jesus was sacrificed on the cross. And we see that, you know, uh, the law was made complete in uh, Christ Jesus. So Paul is saying, you know, um, uh, faith is established what the law has always been telling us that we have fallen short of the glory of God and hence we can all, we can only be made righteous or justified uh, before God through the law of faith or it's the law, the faith that helps us to be made justified and righteous in God's sight. So it's very beautifully, you know, um, and very logically uh, trying to reason out with the Jews, bringing out a, a whole of a lot of Old Testament concepts and and rituals and significance and things that they hold as high regard, uh, you know, uh, and he's trying to bring that out and he's trying to discuss that in a very logical uh, reasoning and understanding. So to help the Jews understand that it's not by rituals, it's not by laws, it's not by the circumcision that we are made righteous in God's eyes and we're not justified 
uh, by keeping the law, but it's through faith. And he goes on to discuss in detail in chapter four about, uh, you know, righteousness by faith. And he talks that so beautifully, uh, bringing about the example of Abraham, who is their patriarch um, and their forerunner. Okay, so we look at that in chapter four, but before we look at chapter four, anyone has any questions? Chapter three? No questions? No questions, Pastor. Okay. Thank you, Japina. Okay, if there are no questions, we'll move on to chapter four, where Paul is talking about righteousness by faith. Now, uh, this chapter can be divided into two main sections. Um, one where he establishes that, uh, you know, um, the, that faith came before the law was given and before the covenants uh, or the, the sign of the covenant that the circumcision was given, you know, Paul establishes the fact that faith was already there before the law and the covenants. And he mentions the example of Abraham. Now, Abraham, for every Jew, uh, was, you know, he was a patriarch. He was their forerunner. He's their father. Uh, so he says that Abraham had faith and he received righteousness by faith. And this happened even before the law was given or even before the sign of the covenant of circumcision was given to Abraham. Abraham was already made righteous or justified in God's eyes because of faith. Okay. Um, and he says the sign of the covenant that the circumcision was given after Abraham uh, received righteousness by faith. So both circumcision and the law came after faith. So what Paul is basically saying is, uh, you know, faith did not show up, you know, after Jesus, you know, but faith was there way back, uh, you know, the time of Abraham, even before the circumcision, before the law. And so He's really now, Paul is really catching their attention. So the Jews can say, hey, now where did this whole concept of we being made righteous by faith come about? You know, we've never heard this. We only uh, thought, we learned that, you know, by keeping the law, we are justified, made righteous before God. Now, what are you telling us, Paul, that we are made righteous not by keeping the law or the, the sign of the covenant circumcision, uh, but by faith? And so he says, you know, he brings in the example of Abraham, how how beautiful it is, you know, uh, so smart of Paul, uh, just like the way that he presents this truth. And he says, you know, uh, you know Abraham, you know, he's saying, you know, your patriarch, your father, uh, he was already justified by faith, not by before the law was given or even um, the sign of uh, circumcision. OK. So it's just how, uh, uh, just amazing how Paul, you know, is expressing the mind of God and helping these people to see that uh, faith is both for the Jews and the uh, Gentiles. Okay. So with this in small introduction, we will look at uh, stud, uh, studying chapter four. Uh, so can someone please read uh, Romans chapter four, verses one to three, please? Romans chapter 4, verse 1 to 4. What one, then shall we say? Sorry, Zelatoli. Sorry to interrupt. Uh, please read Romans chapter 4, verses 1, 2, and 3. Thank you. Okay. Romans chapter 4, verse 1 to 4. What shall we say that Abraham, our father, has found according to the flesh. For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Now to him who works, the wages are not counted as grace, but as death. Amen. Thank you, Zelatoli. So he starts off by asking a question in verse 1. 
what then shall we say that Abraham our father has found according to the flesh okay so uh, you know Jews took much pride in Abraham and David uh, the two great patriarchs Abraham their father the entire uh, Israelite race and David their king who established them in the land that God had appointed uh, for them now when Paul says Abraham uh, you know they understood him as their forefather as their forerunner and so he uses Abraham as a good example and Paul asked this question was Abraham justified by works uh, and Paul, you know, quotes from Old Testament. So we looked at this in the introduction. We saw that, you know, Paul uses a lot of Old Testament scripture, uh, you know, to, uh, uh, to prove his point or, you know, to reason out with the Jews uh, because the Jews were well acquainted, familiar with the Old Testament scripture. So he quotes Genesis chapter 15 verse 6 and he says, Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. So Paul is saying that Abraham received righteousness based on one thing, that is he believed God. Okay. And no one can argue that because uh, that is what scripture says. So he's saying, hey, look, you know, he look at Abraham. What does the scripture say about him? He says he believed God and God, you know, counted it or granted him uh, righteous or made him righteous. Now, the Greek word for accounted, you know, um, that Paul uses in Romans chapter 4 was 3. Uh, is an important word to consider. Uh, Rosalind, can I please ask you to mute your mic? Thank you. Sorry. No, no, no problem. Thank you, Rosalind. So here in um, chapter 4, verse 3, he uses the word accounted. And, uh, you know, the Greek word for counted uh, is something that we need to, you know, important to consider. Now, Paul uses uh, this word 11 times in the same chapter, okay? Uh, in the NKJV, it's translated as accounted. Uh, we see this in verses 3, 5, 9, 10, and 22 of uh, Romans chapter 4. Uh, and we see the word counted in verse 4 and imputes or uh, impute, imputed in verses 6, 8, verse 11, verse 23, and verse 24. Now, uh, the KJV, in the KJV, it's translated um, as counted, reckoned, or imputed, okay? Now, basically, all of these words um, have to do with financial accounting or uh, calculation, and it simply means, you know, to put into someone's account. Um, or in our usage, which would basically mean, you know, to credit in credit into one's account or deposit into one's um, account. So, you know, uh, what Paul is basically saying here is when Abraham believed God, when Abraham trusted God, when he believed God, you know, God deposited to him or in other words, God credited to him or accounted to him righteousness. Okay, or it was put into, uh, God put into Abraham's account, so to say. So Abraham received righteousness by believing God. So Abraham was made righteous or God's righteousness was put into his account or he was clothed with God's righteousness because of the fact that he believed in God, he trusted in God. Okay. Uh, we'll move on, verses 4 to verse 8. Can somebody please read uh, Romans chapter 4, verses 4 to 8, please? Verse 8, verse 4. Now to him who works, the wages are not counted as grace, but as debt. But to him who does not work, but believes on him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is accounted for righteousness. Just as David also describes the blessedness of the man to whom God imputes righteousness apart from works. Blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are covered. 
Blessed is the man to whom the Lord shall not impute sin. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Roslyn. So here in verse 4, he says, if a man works, then, you know, he gets, um, what he gets is uh, not something by grace, but he gets uh, or he's paid what he is owed, you know, uh, he has worked for it. So it is uh, when he gets paid, he's paid what he's owed. And it's not something that he's getting because of grace, but he's getting it because he has done some work. So um, what Paul is basically saying is that, you know, system of work, uh, when we, uh, this is how the system of works happen. So if you say that, you know, it is by keeping the law or it's by doing some work or it is by keeping the sign of the covenant, then we're saying that, you know, God is, uh, you know, debted towards us. He owes us something. It makes God owe us something. You know, it's not his grace or his favor, uh, you know, that he's giving us what he has to give us, but it is, you know, um, it's because of our works that God has a debt that he has to pay us. So he, he owes us something. So he says we can't say that God does not owe us anything. God does not, uh, you know, is not debted towards us. Uh, so we can't say that it's through works that, you know, we are receiving. Then we are totally nullifying the whole thing about grace. But, um, you know, when we, when we say works, we're actually... We're thinking that God owes us salvation or God owes us blessing because of our good works, which is not right. It's the wrong way of thinking. But if we say if a man does not work, he believes he's receiving it purely by grace through faith. OK, so if you're saying that, hey, it's not our works, it's not by keeping the law, it's not by keeping the covenants, then we're saying, uh, you know, we are just trusting God. Uh, then we're saying that we receive it purely by grace through faith. OK, so he's saying Abraham received righteousness purely by believing uh, you know, uh, uh, God, and that is by faith and not by works. OK. Uh, so the righteousness that God gave Abraham is by grace. It was something that God gave to him. Uh, and what is uh, that which God gave to him? It was grace that God gave to him. Um, and, you know, he's uh, so Paul is bringing us to the next point about grace that he will talk about in chapter five. Now, what is grace? What is grace? The Greek word for grace is charis or charis, okay? And it has uh, different usages in the New Testament. Uh, in different places, the word grace can mean different things. It can mean uh, the divine favor or the divine acceptance of God, which means God accepts us just the way we are. You know, uh, we read this in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 says, For grace you have been saved through faith, and it's not of yourself, it's a gift of God. Okay? Grace can also mean, you know, divine character. It's basically the character of God. Uh, we read this in John chapter 1, verse 14, where it says, The Word became flesh and made His dwelling amongst us, and we have seen His glory, the glory of the one and only Son, who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. So, you know, the character of God, full of grace and truth. Um, Truth and the Bible also tells believers in Second Peter chapter three verse eighteen. But grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To Him be the glory both now and forever. Amen. So it says we are all to grow into Christ-like character. So to grow in the grace means grow in Christ-like character. So the second thing that grace can signify in the New Testament is divine character, the character of God. The third thing that grace signifies in the New Testament, sorry, is divine enablement or divine empowerment. Okay. Now, Paul had a thorn in his flesh 
and it was repeated attacks from the enemy and he asked God to take it away and God says my grace is sufficient for you which means you know God was telling Paul uh, you know my divine enablement my divine empowerment is sufficient for you to go through this Paul I'm going to enable you I'm going to empower you to go through this so you know grace is divine enablement which is given to every um, believer okay so we need to uh, you know um, interpret uh, this word grace in the context uh, 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 that is given in scripture to correctly uh, interpret uh, what's the meaning in that given passage um, so in this context when you know we're talking about grace it basically refers to divine favor okay so when Paul is talking about uh, grace here in, um, in 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 this chapter he's basically talking in, in verse 4 he's, he's he's using it in the context not of divine character of God or divine enablement but he's talking about divine favor so he's saying you know it's a divine favor it's a generous deed done out of the heart of the bestower uh, without expecting anything in return so God is justified us made us righteous by his grace that is a divine favor that is upon us okay um, and uh, the grace in us is receiving what we don't deserve we are we don't deserve to be made righteous in God's sight we don't deserve a right standing before God uh, you know we cannot do anything to earn it but it's um, the grace of God that is doing this on our behalf and through us what we could have never done for our uh, selves okay so um, you know grace begins when our ability ends and it's often uh, explained as this acronym uh, G-R-A-C-E you know God's riches at Christ's expense okay so in this context basically it's talking about grace in the context of divine favor where you know we don't deserve it we cannot earn it we cannot buy it by anything that we do but it's just uh, you know God's riches at Christ's expenses because of what Christ has done on the cross that we have been justified or we have been made righteous or we have received this by grace okay now look at this uh, phrase in verse 5 where he says him who justifies uh, the ungodly okay um, this is powerful but it sounds very paradoxical where God is declaring the ungodly as righteous okay yet God can do this because of what Christ has done on the cross for us because of the redemption that is in Christ Jesus uh, which we saw earlier in um, chapter 3 so in chapter 3 we saw that you know uh, Christ redeemed us uh, and uh, we have been justified and we are also Christ uh, is made the propitiation for our uh, sin so uh, we see these uh, you know in uh, in Romans chapter 3 verses 24 to 25 where Paul uses these three key words to describe what God does in response to our sin okay the first one we saw was justification and we know justification has to do with us being set free from the penalty and the condemnation of our sin and being declared righteous before God which means you know you can picture it as us being in the court of law where uh, you know we are condemned we are proved guilty um, but you know uh, we are we are in spite of being condemned and proved guilty we are set free because of the penalty uh, that Christ has made uh, or paid for our sin and then the word redemption has to do with us being set free from the power of sin Satan and all of sin's consequences uh, because uh, Jesus Christ purchased the freedom uh, 
uh, of us from being uh, slaves to sin, uh, Satan, and the consequence of sin. And he paid this ransom price when he died on the cross. And we also looked at propitiation, which has to do with reconciling us back to God, making us friends again with God, you know, where God, uh, 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 where Christ uh, makes the full sufficient, perfect sacrifice, thus appeasing uh, the Father God and drooming his wrath and his you know, his displeasure towards us uh, because of our obedience to sin. So we looked at all of these three key, uh, three uh, words, um, three key words in uh, two verses in Romans chapter 3, verses 24 uh, to 25, okay? So uh, coming back to Romans chapter 4, you know, um, verse 5, um, uh, we saw that, we see that, you know, even though uh, it's a very powerful verse and even though it sounds paradoxical, but God is that God is declaring the ungodly as righteous, yet God could do this because of the redemption price that is in Christ Jesus or because of redemption that is in Christ Jesus, which we saw in chapter three. And then, you know, Paul goes to point out uh, to David in verses six to eight, and he again uh, quotes from the Old Testament. So Paul quotes uh, the first two verses from Psalm 32, but we will look at a few more additional verses to understand the context of Psalm 32. So can somebody please read Psalm chapter 32 verses one to five, please? Psalm chapter 32 verses one to five. Can somebody read that please? Psalms 32, verses 1 to 5. Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord does not impute iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no deceit. When I kept silent, my bones grew old through my groaning all the day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My vitality was turned into the drought of summer. I acknowledged my sin to you and my iniquity I have not hidden. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Rosalind. So Paul is pointing out uh, to David, you know, um, where he's saying David, you know, received this righteousness apart from works. How did uh, you know, how was David made righteous? In this context, he confessed his sin and he received forgiveness, okay? By faith, he received the blessedness of having his sin forgiven. So it's not by works that he was forgiven. It was not by works that he was, uh, you know, he was made righteous, but uh, by faith, he received the blessedness of having his sins forgiven, okay? In verse uh, 6, Paul says, just as David also describes the blessedness of the man to whom God imputes righteousness apart from works. Now let's look at this phrase, the blessedness, or let's consider this phrase, the blessedness of the man whom God declares righteous, which means, you know, um, declares righteous means credits with righteousness or you know puts into his account righteousness or puts into his account say you know so being declared righteous you know uh, brings us to a place of blessedness okay uh, blessings that we cannot receive by any other means uh, or being in any other place but blessings that we received we receive because, you know, we believe by faith and God's righteousness is put into our account. And because of that, we are blessed or we come to a place of blessing. So it says, blessed is a man whose sins are uh, forgiven. So even he's saying uh, are in the context of being forgiven of our sins, it's not by keeping the law. It's not by following some covenants or you know, the rituals or, um, you know, some feasts. Uh, but he says, you know, a man is forgiven 
by his sins when you know he um, he asks for his sins to be forgiven and he is uh, you know made a righteous before god uh, and he comes to a place of being blessed so he says blessed is the man whose sins are forgiven so he's saying he's talking about sins being forgiven in the context of being made righteous by faith just you know david uh, receiving his forgiveness by just believing that god has forgiven him his sins and also he's saying that you know we come to a place of blessedness not because of some works that we have done not the things that we do or by things that we keep but it's because we are blessed because of God's uh, righteousness, because we come to a place where we believe by faith uh, in what Christ has done, in what God has done for us. Okay. Any questions so far on verses 1 to 6? I hope you are understanding this. Um, basically, no discussions, no questions. Um, Nobody is asking for any clarity, so I'm just assuming that all of you are understanding or you're still in doubt and are not able to understand well. Good if you can, you know, speak up and ask some questions and bring out some discussions. Class can be even more meaningful and energetic and lively. Any questions? Anything that you need clarification on? No, for now, Pastor. We are just listening attentively and picking up points. Okay. Thank you, Lubega. Okay. If there's no questions or no one needs any clarifications, um, we'll move on uh, to verses 4, 9 to 12. Sorry, verses 9 to 12. But Paul is talking about righteousness given by faith even before circumcision. So he's dealt with, you know, the law. He's saying it's not by keeping the law or by the works of the law that we are justified or righteous, uh, but it's by faith. And he also says our sins are forgiven and we are blessed or come to a place of being blessed, not because of keeping the law or doing the law or the works of the law, but it's um, because of Christ's righteousness or it's by faith in Christ that makes us uh, righteousness, that brings us to a place of forgiveness and a state of uh, blessedness or a place of receiving God's blessing. And then he goes on to talk about the another aspect which the Jews hold on to, uh, you know, which has been a common issue and a problem is, you know, they're forcing the Gentiles to be uh, circumcised or keeping the sign of circumcision, uh, which is the sign of the covenant. Uh, so he talks about that in verses 9 to 12. So can somebody um, read verses 9 to 12, please? Oh, sorry, it's uh, time up. Uh, I just missed out on the time. Okay, we look at uh, verses 9 to 12 in the next uh, class. Um, but before we end, anyone has any anything to say? I hope uh, the explanation is sufficient. You are able to understand. At least give me some inputs on, on the class. Is there clarity in my explanation? Or are you all able to understand? Or it's going way beyond your head? Is something that you're not able to? OK, thank you, Jeffina. Anyone else? Is explanation clear? If you need more clarity? OK, no response. OK. Uh, Okay, thank you. Thank you, Zelatoli. Thank you, Jeffina. Okay, thank you everyone for joining class. Have a blessed weekend. I'll see you on uh, Monday.